Ellie Cohenim, Senior Fellow for the Center of Security Policy. Thanks for joining us on CBN News. Chris, shalom. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, great to be with you, too. This week, there was a lot of news on Capitol Hill. Uh, Democrats actually pulled out the funding for the, uh, Israel's Iron Dome anti-missile system. It looks like it's going to be voted on separately, but what signal does this send uh, you know, from the progressive arm of the Democratic Party? Chris, like you said, um, I think many of us are happy to know that uh, that this bill will be um, reintroduced separately and, and ultimately Israel will get funding for this defensive weapon system. But let's be clear, um, this sends a very strong and bad signal towards Israel regarding the U.S.-Israel relationship. Um, the very fact that this very small group of progressives were able to convince the Democratic Party to, build it, to pull this $1 billion funding that uh, Israel desperately needs, it's, it's a defensive uh, weapons capability. And so just so the audience understands, in this last Gaza conflict, when Hamas rained down over 4,000 thousand rockets on Israeli civilians and civilian population centers. It was the Iron Dome defensive system, which, um, you know, kind of has this glorious shooting up in the air and blocking the missiles from raining down on Israeli civilians. So um, how does this make any sense for these so-called progressives to want to block Israel from having a defensive measure to protect its civilians. It makes zero sense. And so, Chris, this is a terrible development, indeed, for the U.S.-Israel relationship. Does this signal that the, these progressive Democrats like AOC, Ilhan Omar, uh, are going to have a, a greater role and voice in the Democratic Party, especially as it applies to Israel? Chris, you know what? I think for them, this is a tremendous success that they were able to block this this funding, and uh, and it just it's a very big flex of power on their part. And so, what we saw in response, for example, is um, Israel's former ambassador to the United States, Michael Oren, uh, was interviewed saying that he thinks perhaps it's time for the Israelis to stop relying on the United States for this kind of funding that it makes the Israelis look weak. And you know what? I can't help but uh, think that he might be onto something. Um, it's, it's a sad state of affairs where Israel has to think about things in that way in terms of the U.S.-Israel relationship. But the Israelis do need to think about their projection of strength and, uh, and whether it does make sense for them to rely on the U.S. in the long run. Look, I hope that this becomes a one-time blip. I hope that this is not an indication of future trends. But if the Democratic Party continues to move in this direction, which what I think has been the Corbynization of the Democratic Party, like what happened in London's, uh, in U.K.'s Labour Party, where we saw under the um, influence of Jeremy Corbyn, the, the party moved more and more to the left and become more and more anti-Israel. I think we're seeing the same development now in the United States and the Democrat Party. And so if that becomes a long-term trend, then Israel truly does need to think about its own security needs and how to protect itself. And again, its projection of strength to the world. And, and Ellie, one of those main concern, concern, security concerns for Israel is uh, the Iranian nuclear program. Now, the, even uh, President Biden said the other day he's willing to go back to the original uh, JCPOA. Uh, is Iran one of those main threats uh, that Israel may have to rethink its relationship with the United States? Well, you know, Israel's former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said over and again that uh, Iran is the only country that poses an existential threat to Israel, so meaning, you know, it can threaten Israel's entire existence. And certainly Iran developing um, nuclear weapons capability would, uh, would seem to be an existential threat to Israel because the Iranian supreme leader and others have over and again said that they hope to quote unquote eliminate the Jewish state of Israel. Now, um, in terms of whether Israel, um, you know, Naftali Bennett, Israel's new prime minister, was just in the United States and he met with President Biden. And, and we know the reports were that a key part of that conversation was the, was the Iranian threat and, uh, and how the U.S. and Israel can work together to contain the threat. It's very, it's hard to tell right now exactly what direction that's going to go. But one thing that the Israelis have been very successful over and again is um, what's attributed to the Israelis is these, um, these explosions in Iran where their uh, nuclear sites 
and other sites uh, literally have these explosions that happen and, and many in the intelligence communities internationally do attribute that to Israel. And so the Israelis have somehow managed to this point to keep the Iranians from developing this nuclear uh, weapons capability while at the same time it, the United States and European powers through China and, and Russia are engaging Iran in the Iran nuclear talks in Vienna. So this is a developing story, but I think that even this new government in Israel understands that they can never allow Iran to become a nuclear bomb country. Yeah. Uh, Elia, uh, Iran is not only trying to develop uh, its own nuclear weapon, but it has proxies all over the region, uh, Iraq, Syria, including in Yemen. And I, I understand you spoke at the uh, UN Human Rights Council about some of the uh, developments there. Uh, tell us about that. Chris, I was invited on the sidelines of the UN human rights meetings in uh, Geneva, and I just I just got back from there, and I was indeed asked to speak about the Iranian proxy terrorist activities, um, because as you said, Chris, you know what the Iranians have been successful in doing in their foreign policy is um, to continue to move forward their nuclear weapons capabilities to continue on their ballistic missile development and at the same time they have been training arming and funding uh, terrorist proxies all across the Middle East and North Africa region. And so we've seen the terror proxy capability of Hamas now against Israel in this most recent conflict in May. We've seen Hezbollah terror proxy activity of Iran coming from Lebanon towards Israel. Um, we've seen the Iranian terrorist proxy activity in, in Iraq and the complete destabilization in Iraq. And we've seen the Iranian presence in Syria, which is causing a tremendous loss of life there and also um, a threat to Israel. What we're also seeing is that the Iranians are, again, uh, training, arming, and funding the Houthi militias in Yemen, who, um, who took control over the country there, completely destabilized the country, have caused the most horrible humanitarian crisis there, threatening our, Audi, uh, our allies, Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and also what the Houthi militias have done is that they have completely incorporated the Iranian hateful ideology of hating the Jewish people and hating the state of Israel. And, uh, and so since coming into power, the Houthis have carried out ethnic cleansing against a very small community of Jews that were left in Yemen. We're talking about under 100 people who were left in Yemen when the Houthis took control, and yet they have, over time, driven out every last Jew, Jew from Yemen. Now, Yemeni Jews, just to note, um, had a history that dates back over 2,000 years. This is one of the most ancient indigenous groups in the world. And so the Houthi Iranian proxies have committed ethnic cleansing. They have driven every last Jew out of Yemen. And yet they have held on to one man. His name is Levi Marhabi, Salim Marhabi. He's been kept captive by the Houthi militia for now almost five years. In November of 2020, the U.S. State Department, which at the time I was privileged to serve as uh, the deputy envoy to combat anti-Semitism, the State Department, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called for the release of Levi Marhabi. He's been wrongfully detained. He is an innocent man, Chris. His only crime is that of being a Jew. Mm. So I understand the last 13 Jews have left uh, uh, Yemen uh, on their way to Egypt, but the, this, uh, this hostage uh, remains behind. Exactly right. And, uh, and Chris, I would tell you that we need from our Christian friends, we need prayers for Levi Marhabi, but we also need help. Uh, we need everyone to raise their voices and let the U.S. government know, let the international community know that, again, there's this one last Jew that's left in, in a Houthi prison. He's in deterior deteriorating condition. Um, he's been kept uh, wrongfully detained now for over four years. We're getting on almost five years now by the Houthi militia. This is an innocent Jewish man. They are just keeping him because he's a Jew. And we also understand, I think, nine uh, prisoners were executed uh, not too long ago without trial, including a 15-year-old uh, at the time of his incarceration. Exactly right. Um, the Houthis are, are taking um, their lessons directly from the Iranian regime. They're committing the most heinous human rights violations against the Yemeni people. Like you said, Chris, 
they just this week executed nine men without any semblance of a fair trial. Um, one of them was a 17-year-old who was 15 at the time of his detainment. And uh, I can tell you that the people, the Yemeni human rights community that invited me to Geneva to speak, um, they are, are just, you know, the entire Yemeni world, they're just traumatized by this. They can't get over the pain of what took place in their country and what's being done to their fellow countrymen. And, uh, and it's really a humanitarian crisis of epic proportions. And the, the difference between right and wrong in Yemen is just so clear. It's truly, truly time for the international community to put, to put, a, to put a foot down and put a stop to this Houthi violation of the Yemeni people's human rights. Uh, Ellie, turning to uh, Afghanistan and the recent U.S. pullout there, what do you see as the p geopolitical ramifications of the U.S. pulling out of Afghanistan? Chris, the, the geopolitical ramifications are, are just so tremendous. Um, I think many of us in, uh, in the national security space um, find their minds are boggled at the, the debacle that took place with the U.S. Uh, pull out of Afghanistan, you know, um, there were many who for years had been advocating for a pullout, but um, there was a way to have done this in an orderly manner that would not have cost uh, necessarily the loss of U.S. lives. Um, I think the first mistake that was committed by the Biden administration was abandoning the Bagram Air Base. Uh, the Bagram Air Base is the, is, was the size of a town in the United States, and more importantly, what it, Bagram did was that it provided air cover because we had uh, all these military planes that were on Bagram. And so the Biden administration chose to, to, to leave Bagram in the middle of the night uh, without telling our Afghan allies that we were leaving. They literally shut down the lights in the middle of the night and that became indication to uh, the Taliban forces. They understood that the U.S. had left and they started to uh, go into Bagram and loot and, and steal weapons. And then from there we saw that the United States abandoned $85 billion of weapons system in Afghanistan. And in essence, what we did was we armed the Taliban and we gave them our most um, advanced weapons systems. And so now the, the Taliban terrorists have uh, more advanced weapons systems than, than a lot of our ally countries do around the world. Um, we also apparently left behind biometric information. So that means uh, genetic uh, identifiers, you know, through the eyes and other places. And so we apparently left this behind for the Taliban so that they will now be able to identify all those Afghanis who were helping the U.S. forces when we were there over the years. Um, and, and so we can go on and on at the level of incompetence, lack of planning uh, that took place under this administration. It's shocking. I don't think people can really wrap their brains around it. What we do know is that we are going to be facing the repercussions of this chaos for years to come. And again, we have just now armed one of the most uh, horrible anti-American and anti-Israel uh, terrorist groups in the world right now. And so, Chris, I think that what I am comfortable predicting, unfortunately, is that Americans will pay the price for this uh, This completely chaotic, disorderly, and uh, poorly planned out pullout. Yeah, that, that sadly may be uh, true, Ellie. Final question, uh, the UN, you were just at one of the agencies there in Geneva. Uh, do you see that it's possible that the UN may actually recognize the Taliban government as the uh, uh, legitimate government in Afghanistan? Chris, the UN has such a terrible track record you know, they were created uh, as a force to create, uh, to, to, uh, to create international peace in the world. And the United Nations, sadly, um, has, has just a terrible track record when it comes to uh, the passage of their Zionism is racism bill, which took so many years to reverse. When it comes to their obsessive focus with Israel, when you have the most heinous, heinous human rights violations being committed by, for example, the Chinese Communist Party against the Uyghur Muslims. Um, and so I am not optimistic about the United Nations. I have to be honest with you, Chris. Uh, I wouldn't put it past the UN to recognize the Taliban. Taliban, but it is definitely an issue for them because, as you know, uh, the the Afghan government, the past Afghan government, does have a representative in the United Nations. And so if the UN were to actually go forward with recognizing the Taliban, I think it would send a tremendous uh, signal around the world that even the United Nations is now somehow giving legitimacy to terrorist organizations. 
Yeah, uh, could it would be, be a said, terrible move. Right, I, I would agree, Ellie. Uh, Ellie Cohenheim, uh, a senior fellow for the Center for Security Policy. Thanks so much for joining us.